Welcome to the Political Trenches, Local Government at Work, the podcast where Ian McCormick and I delve into the heart of the most significant municipal news stories spanning Canada from coast to coast to coast. Each episode, we dissect the decisions and explore the dynamic landscapes of local governance. Today, we bring you the letter U, which stands for Unprecedented Challenges. Later in the episode, we have tech entrepreneur Walter Schwabe on the show. But first, it's 2024. Ian, how are you? It's a whole new year, Chris. We do this all over again. Except this year, of course, we have one more day than we did last year, this being a leap year. So having a bit of a break was nice. Getting a start was nice. As I was uh, mentioning just before we started, we brought another new person on into our Newfoundland office. So it's a new year for us as well. So, And you, how was your break? It was good. We got a lot of downtime. We're sort of getting sort of up and running as the new year starts. And we're sort of still in this oh, sort of hold period right now until February when we return with crossword interviews and ev- episodes every single day. But we have fantastic guests already lined up. First 15 episodes are already lined up. So I'm excited and I'm looking forward to s- l- releasing those on as of February 5th. But we're not here to talk about that show. We're here to talk about the <laughs> stories. That's right. And we have a packed uh, show for everyone today. And I want to start off in the city of Airdrie. And the city of Airdrie has stated that it will not be communicating the municipal tax increase as a percentage going forward. As reported by City View Airdrie, according to city officials, the change has been brought forward for several reasons. Now, according to the newspaper report, a city official said in an email to the weekly newspaper, quote, most importantly, because the percentage is misleading. If Calgary increases taxes by 5% and Airdrie increases taxes by 5%, residents would assume that is equivalent when it is actually not equivalent at all for either the amount of dollars that translates to for the municipality or the effect on its residents. End quote. Now, the city states that using the dollar amount for the average house price when presenting the tax increase is a more transparent way and true assessment when it comes to comparing with other municipalities and assessing change in air dream. So, Ian, I've got to ask right off the bat. Is this a smart move for the city of Airdrie to do this type of move? Because this is unheard of. I haven't heard other municipalities doing this. I've heard of it a couple of times. And uh, good move or bad move? The the person you quoted used the term misleading, that uh, increases could be misleading because of the comparator between other municipalities. I'm not sure that's the right word, actually, because... For a percentage increase or potentially decrease, I guess, in taxes, to me as the homeowner, it doesn't make any difference whether it's Airdrie or Calgary. For the municipality, however, a 1% increase brings in a whole lot more money in Calgary than a 1% increase does in, in Airdrie. So in that way, I guess it could be that not ne- while not misleading, that the impact is not really well known. I, I think it's a kind of a really interesting move. As long as we can get away from or avoid somehow the conspiracy theorists saying, well, obviously they're doing it as a way to hide the tax increase, which I can kind of see is something that is potentially going to happen. But for but me, you must say be following I'm... Twitter over the last few months then, because <laughs> that's what's actually been said on social media. <laughs> oh, is it? All right. Uh, yeah. Well, anytime anything changes for the better or for the worse, there's always a conspiracy behind it. No good deed goes unpunished. These tax, these dollars, however, whether it's percent or real, are real dollars that I, as a resident, end up paying or the municipality as the collector can use to deliver services to me. And if you get away from the actual percent, you can start to talk about value. And I think I mentioned this in probably in my first book about what does the municipality do with the dollars that the citizens or the ratepayers provide? Right? If I give a, my municipality $1,000, for example, do I feel like I get $1,500 in value? Do I feel like I get $500 in value? That's got nothing to do with a percent. That's got to do with how well the, the municipality, in my opinion, as a resident, is actually deploying those dollars to provide the services that they ought to. So what am I getting or not getting? I think it's an interesting move. I would not be surprised to see more municipalities do it. And it gets away from the pure number and into something that... Like actually means something in terms of what the municipality is delivering. And I'm, I, I am getting. 
Well, when I when I read this story, I found it fascinating because I, some, some somewhat similar to what you were just talking about there for a few seconds, at Ian. But when I was a communications coordinator for a municipality, whenever it came around to tax time, you would always have to try to under, uh, explain to people what 5% actually meant or what 2% actually meant. Mm -hmm. The issue is 5% for a house at 350000 evaluation is not the same as a 5% increase for 250000 So right. it does even it out. The issue that I have, though, with this, and this is where I'm kind of sort of leading you a little bit here, is that 5% is just, if I'm not mistaken, and correct me if I'm wrong, because you're a little bit more knowledgeable than I am on this situation, um, that that 5% is just the mill rate. So that doesn't include the property, the, the education part of it, the provincial sales tax. So they're just saying, we're going to take that all aside, and we're just going to give you what it's going to cost the city of Airdrie to charge their or their increase for residents for the city of Airdrie, correct? This is not anything to do with the property tax, the education tax, or even the provincial tax that they get, right? Right. Well, let's ignore all those other taxes that you mentioned, the provincial portion for schools in some places, or in some places. But, uh, but, but I think we can't, but I think we can't. And I, I got to challenge okay. you on here because sure. when, 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 you, when you say a 5% tax increase, the average resident, and I, I hate painting a broad stroke here, the, uh, the average resident assumes that that 5% is everything. Everything. Right. Yeah. So, so while we, while we have to take those out, we have to keep them in because you're now saying this is just the city portion that is going to go up. And we'll do the hokey pokey and turn ourselves yeah. up. So anyway, uh, I think your point stands that I mean, I used to be involved in a property attack, property assessment, and it was I mean, the property tax is whatever my house is worth times the percentage of that value, which is as you had referenced the mill rate. So as assessments, the worth of the house or a condo or whatever goes up and down, that has a real impact on how much money I will end up paying to the municipality. Whereas the tax percent change has a slightly different impact. So in a in a rising market, you end up paying more. In a market that's depressed, you end up paying less. And if the average house in Airdrie is six hundred thousand dollars, let's say, they're paying a certain amount. If this you put the same house into Toronto and all of a sudden it's one point two million dollars, you end up paying you end up paying more if the property tax rate is the same. Or it looks like you're paying less because the property tax rate is less. Ultimately, it, it has an impact on how much money goes into the coffers of the municipality. So Quebec has granted municipalities new powers with the aim of diversifying their revenue resources. Bill 39 was passed unanimously in December. The piece of legislation was originally drawn up with the aim of consolidating transfers of Quebec sales taxes to municipalities. It also allows municipalities to tax vacant dwellings. Municipalities that provide public transit services will also have the right to tax vehicle registrations based on fuel consumptions. Now, the Federation of Quebecois de Municipalities welcomed the adoption of Bill 39, arguing that it represents a significant step towards modernizing the rules governing municipal taxation. Now, Ian... Municipalities have been calling for a new fiscal framework with provinces and the federal government for some time. Is Quebec kind of leading the charge here with Bill uh, 39? I think they are. I think this is really kind of interesting. Um, first of all, congratulations on your uh, Quebec accent all the way from Calgary, that bang on. the This is something that, you're right, municipalities have been calling for. They've got very limited levers that they can actually pull around budget. They've got their... Uh, transfers from other orders of government. They've got property tax in most places in Canada. They've got the fees and charges that they um, charge people to take advantage of their services. They've maybe got some investments and things like this. But what's happened here is a recognition that the economic activity that's occurring within a municipality, some of that might go back to the municipality in terms of the recognition of a portion of the property tax. When it comes to things like the tax on, vac on vacant buildings, that's something that is happening elsewhere. I think BC, for example. When it comes to uh, differential taxation based on fuel consumption, that's an interesting one too. Uh, that would not fly in other parts of the country nearly as well. As Alberta? Maybe, <laughs> maybe Alberta, right? Yeah, maybe Saskatchewan. Maybe it doesn't fly as well there. So it is interesting to me that the provincial government passed unanimously, which is the part that gets me, passed this that uh, just before Christmas, they're saying, yeah, here you go, municipalities, a little bit more, another lever, if you like, in your um, in your 
yeah, or arrow in your quiver or lever in your toolbox that you can actually use to provide those services to some people. This happens in the States too, that in some places in the United States where uh, municipalities can have their own property tax, uh, sorry, not property tax, sorry, sales tax uh, within the bounds of their municipality. And so that becomes a source of revenue. The interesting thing there it becomes competitive if two cities beside one another have slightly different sales taxes that they charge to people who buy things within the municipality, business is naturally going to gravitate to the lowest cost area. So it ends up being really competitive compared with the other things that people choose, why people choose to live or do business in a municipality. So it's new to my knowledge in Canada. It's not new for all. Uh, it's interesting that the comment came from the Provincial Municipal Association saying that this was good. And I think other municipal associations are watching. The Federation of Canadian Municipalities might have an eye on this too and be bringing it up through some of their provincial advocacy work because this isn't something that really would do have an impact on federally in terms of potential tax changes because every province and territory manages or handles municipal governments in a slightly different fashion. So yeah, Quebec, I think in terms of this is leading and it might annoy some of the other provinces too. So we'll have to see what happens there. Well, we always look at Quebec as sort of the uh, the sort of the child that is given a lot of things in the confederation, but they also lead on a lot of innovative ways and innovative methods. Now, and I say that because I'm looking at how the province of Quebec deals with their municipalities. They negotiate with the federal government as a whole. Now, the premiers of Saskatchewan, Alberta, New Brunswick, and PEI have all said, well, if it's good for them, well, it should be good for them, us. So we could potentially be seeing some new taxations that the provinces are going to be handing down to municipalities in 2025 if this goes over well. I'm mm -hmm. not assuming all of these, like you said, <laughs> the fuel consumption is probably not going to be something that's going to be happening out here out west, but I've seen stranger things. Do you think that sort of, and I hate to put it this way, but Quebec has become sort of a test tube for any potential taxation changes, or is this just something that as municipal observers, we're going, this could be something that we should be watching in 2024? I think it's the latter, actually. Quebec has done some innovative things over the years, daycare, for example, or funding for post-secondary education, those sort of things, which I mean, have no argument per se, but do provide the the idea that Quebec the, the the provincial government in Quebec is willing to listen to ideas that are something that they don't know whether it's going to work or not this they've also been willing I think to be a little bit more large big government and many if not all other provinces have as well and so this is another I think another part of this so it's become more culturally acceptable in Quebec maybe than it is somewhere else so the town of Soyuz, British Columbia, will be holding a special meeting of council on January 12th at the Sonora Community Centre focused on the 2024 budget and the attached 37% tax hike. After massive public backlash over the one of the largest residential tax hikes ever seen and over 100% hikes to water and sewer utility rates, the town council will be holding a public meeting on possible changes to them. Now, the town says that the cause of the increases, which were adopted in October of 2023, is both increasing infrastructure costs and a history of keeping taxes low for the community. Now, Ian, I have been seeing more and more of these public hearing type of events happening across Canada right. recently. Recently, in to, at the end of 2023, we saw one in Chestermere. Do these type of public hearings actually change the minds of councillors, or is it just a way for elected officials to let residents vent? Well, we've just come through Festivus, and the area airing of grievances apparently is going likely to continue. So first of all, I feel for the council and staff in the town of Osoyoos we may have discussed this before, and I think it's it's a tough one all around. The current council, as you had said, is dealing with, to me, it's a multiple whammy, some of which you already mentioned. So inflation comes into this. Aging infrastructure and asset management comes into this. And the fact that short-sighted councillors kept taxes artificially low previously comes into this as well. And so now we put those, some, those things together and chickens have come home to roost. When it comes to holding these meetings, which probably aren't isn't legislatively required. Uh, it's it's good for council and staff, I guess, for probably facing an angry mob. I don't imagine people are particularly thrilled to be around here. So good for them for hosting the meeting in the first place. 
I don't think it would end up being a decision making meeting. I have a an idea that it may not a be a particularly rational meeting, that it might just be that bearing of grievances or whatever's going on. And I wonder how much overlap there is between those who demanded low taxes before, knowing they weren't paying the way, and those who are outraged now that that has set in. So the meeting, I, 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 I good on them for holding the meeting. I, I wonder what the effect of it will be, the impact will be, what kind of things will come out of it, any of those sort of things. Because if there is even the slightest expectation that, hey, if enough people say this is a terrible idea, the council is all of a sudden going to reverse their decision and say, you know what, instead of 37% tax increase, we're going to do another 0% this year. I don't think they would do that because they've finally bitten that off. And I, I'm hopeful that they can back get on onto their fiscal feet and make a so sustain fiscally sustainable over the long run for future councils because these one these council members are being courageous right now. We'll be right back with tech entrepreneur Walter Schwabi. Welcome to You is for unprecedented challenges on the political trenches, local government at work. Our guest today is Walter Schwabi. With over 20 years of public speaking experience, Walter has advised thousands of business professionals, public sector employees, and elected officials from all three levels of government. He is a passionate serial tech entrepreneur with over 25 years of experience, having most recently held the position on the board as CEO of visual AI startups, Dream ML Incorporated. Walter has owned or has been a partner in multiple tech companies over the years. For the past 20 years, he has also been a public speaker, having presented on stage in front of thousands of people. He has routinely educated live audiences on subjects related to leadership, innovation, and emerging technologies, and their impact on business and government. So with that, welcome to the Political Trenches, Walter. Well, it's uh, great to be here, Chris uh, and Ian. Thank you so much. I'm looking forward to it. Yeah, well, let's get right into it then, Walter. Uh, you're no stranger to local government, <clears throat> working with local governments and local government people. Uh, you and I have known each other for a lot of years. So I'm really, it's interesting. I think I probably, you're turning the tables on you from times we've gone by where you've probably interviewed me about something. But because we are sticking primarily or exclusively to the role of AI and local government, where do you see AI either being used now or potentially being used in coming years within the realm of local governments? Well, as many of your viewers may, you know, be well aware already that the, the last year AI has been on the tip of everybody's tongue uh, for all sorts of reasons, but predominantly uh, a massive domino got knocked over. And, and that is, I don't think that, you know, society at large was was really quite prepared for all of the change that, that started to happen and that is changing, uh, uh, will continue to change going forward. And that largely happens to, uh, you know when when new tech comes in and is and is released but in this case automation largely around administrative duties repetitive duties things that require um you know pattern recognition it's kind of like the the mind numbing tasks that we all do from time to time um uh, the rubber stamping of of things that automation is is taking hold and, and what that's going to do is change dramatically the way the workforce looks um, and acts uh, today. So uh, one word that you may have heard before is upskilling. And um, everybody's going to have to get to know that word pretty quickly. So I want to jump in there for a second, because we, we've sort of painted a rosy picture here, but I'm the doom and gloom type of person who always looks at the negative sides of anything new that comes out. Um, what do you see as sort of the main challenges or concerns associated with implementing AI into the government process? Because right now we are seeing a major concern about privacy breaches and even security breaches for organizations. Is this a concern that municipalities should sort of be warranted about before they sort of dip their toe into the AI pool? Well, actually, um, first of all, this show isn't long enough to d dive down this rabbit hole. The, the, the reality is, is that um, I'll give you just a, a brief bit of background. The, the, the fact is, is that um, OpenAI released ChatGPT, uh, you know, 
without having solved for control and containment. And, and what that really means is that um, as the level of intelligence of the algorithms that we're talking about, these large language models, um, as they continue to evolve, we're, we're inching closer to something, you know, called super intelligence or artificial general intelligence. The problem is, though, that we as humanity have not solved uh, for being able to control that. And so uh, very rapidly, and, and the, you know, these numbers are changing all the time. It's, it's the fastest moving tech um, environment that I've ever experienced in my personal life. And, and I'm sure, you know, just about everybody else will say the same thing. Um, the fact is, is that uh, by, you know, some say 2030, uh, we will not be the smartest being on the planet. So, while you talk about cybersecurity in a municipal government, you know, IT infrastructure, what we need to do is take a step back and understand that what happens when we're not the smartest uh, cats on the block anymore and um, we're not calling the shots as a result of that. Uh, in fact, the, you know, things are happening at a pace that, uh, you know, will cascade to just accelerating that effect. Uh, there's something called the singularity, and I won't go, uh, you know, really into that. But by 2045, it is predicted that AI will be as smart as every human being, all 8 billion of us, on the planet. So on this side, our entire global population and all of our collective intelligence. On this side, an AI who is smarter than all of that. You, uh, Walt, you've been talking quite a bit here, the things that... Chris made the reference to doom and gloom, and you've been talking about things we have to be prepared for and watch out for. Is there an upside to the use of AI? Oh, I mean, the, the, this is the, this is the uh, you know, I have a, a label or a title for one of my presentations, which is the, I call it the AI paradox. Because on, on one side, the amount of, you know, really amazing things from, you know, compliance, bylaw compliance to uh, all of, a lot of things that take a whole lot of people to do shuffle paper, go through a bunch of stuff, you know, that stuff's going to happen a whole lot quicker, way faster and more accurately. Um, so you put this into the context of, say, healthcare, put this in the context of, you know, crime prevention, there's all sorts of positives that uh, will come out of the implement implementation of this technology. Um, you know, in my past, in the in one of the role that you had mentioned there, Chris, uh, at StreamML, we we helped the city of uh, Kelowna count trees more accurately. So really, counting these assets within the municipal boundaries far more accurately than they could before, right? And so th it's just something as simple as, and it wasn't simple actually at all, but. Uh, counting trees, you know, if you just state it that way, it sounds like a simple task, but in, in, in reality, it's really quite difficult. So uh, leveraging the technology in, in, in so many ways, the, the benefits are going to be tremendous. What it means, though, is that we as a society then have to be prepared for the change. That means that if I, my job was to count trees yesterday, what am I now upskilling to do something else within the municipal government, right, to continue, you know, hopefully keep my job or, uh, you know, do a different job uh, entirely, right? So we have to be, our number one superpower has to be our willingness to adapt and change. Those individuals who leverage AI in their job will be more solid than those people who don't use AI at all. So AI plus human is greater than just human. I'd like to move it to the political realm a little bit. So far, you've talked quite a lot about doing stuff. There are decisions that end up being made for the long-term benefit of the people who happen to live in a particular place or a particular region. Where do you see AI being used or even abused by either elected officials or candidates or those types of folks? The largest concern I have for elected officials, and we're gonna see this happen next year. Uh, well, actually, sorry, this year, um, <laughs> uh, I just got caught. Uh, you know, we're going to see this in terms of deep fakes. So uh, deep fakes, and we 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 chuckled about avatars taking our jobs here in this in this conversation. 
But what if someone was to take our image, our voice, and create an entire video saying a whole bunch of really horrible things that I didn't say or you didn't say? And, you know, we're all three elected officials. And now, of course, uh, it just gets thrown out there, right? So how do you how do you protect against that? How do you verify and validate the message that's coming at you? Uh, you know, even if it looks like, and there's, there's an interesting um, TikTok account uh, called Deep Fake Tom Cruise. And I, I, you know, I just inspire you to look at it. And basically, it's a guy who has similar, you know, not obviously identical to Tom Cruise, but the AI lays a mask over top of his face, and it looks really close. And then also the voice. So his mannerisms, he has to act like Tom Cruise, but um, it's really kind of freaky. And he, he's not the only one that uh, has, you know, adopted this technology to play around with it. But deep fakes, I think, are probably from a elected official issue. And, and you know, look, um, it, there, there's actually just, uh, I think it's just within the last couple of weeks, in fact, uh, there was a uh, an article out in a small town where some kids were playing around with some AI and, and, and was, you know, they kind of went too far. So the, the, the fact is, is that um, back in what, the mid 2000s, they were talking about social media and, and you know, how to, how to interact in a world that was filled with social media applications. And I mean, 2009, 2010, it's nothing like today. So uh, AI is uh, the new tool for mischief in a lot of ways. And of course, the industry has to self regulate and but policymakers have to come out and uh, start talking about policy as well. You've uh, well to the last while you've been talking a lot about kind of current state, potential future state, and we haven't had time to delve into this. You made a reference to that earlier too. Are there places as we wrap up? Are there places and people tools that you might suggest that people who watch and listen to this podcast might be able to use to educate themselves a little bit more? About uh, and else? Well, uh, you know, there, <laughs> the the amount of tools uh, you know is expanding rapidly. But I, I there's a few of my favorites that I I kind of like to uh, like to go to. So I mean. Lots of folks will have heard, at least, of Chat GPT, which is a large language model. It's a chatbot, right? Uh, but what's interesting about this is that uh, I use a an application called Perplexity.ai, and I'll, Perplexity is a research chatbot. So I don't actually go to Google anymore. And the reason I don't go to Google, and the reason why their search business is under attack is because of um, AIs like this that will, you will type in a question, like for example, you know, what is the ideal size of X, right? This, you know, and it will go back and it'll research all the answers for you and then display those citing the, the sources. Whereas if you were to type that into Google search window, you would get just a host of a whole bunch of stuff that would come back and you'd have to go figure it out for yourself, right? So perplexity saves me a tremendous amount of time by giving me the research to the precise question I've asked, which I really appreciate. Now it's still a little bit general generalized, okay? But it's pretty accurate and it's pretty good. So that's one example, that's just one scenario uh, to try. Um, pi.ai so pi which stands for personal intelligence dot ai um, this was launched by um, the the original co-founder of google's deep mind at one point deep mind was the most powerful ai company in the world it got bought out by google he then set the ethical framework for how google would build ai uh, he does state that the majority of this um, and his last name is Suleiman. Um, he's launched Pi because he wants it to be more ethical, more morally focused. And so it's a it's a really nice conversational chatbot compared to anything else that you'll use out there. And I really like the, the purpose behind it. Uh, and in fact, that's moving towards the therapy. So if you're a therapist, you're a psychologist, you're a psychiatrist, all of those areas in terms of therapy, there are chatbots that have uh, just absorbed everything about that area, right? And now, as long as they can have that sort of soft human approach, 
accurately come back and now you've got a therapist in your phone. I, I want to talk about sort of the, the last question that I have, and it's about sort of the, the general topic of today's episode, which is unprecedented challenges. Now, we've talked about what AI has done up till now, and there's always going to be something new. There's always going to be something better in the years to come. We didn't have chat GTP at the beginning of 2023, and now look at where we are at the end of at the beginning of 2024. What do you see on the horizon as sort of an unprecedented challenge in the open AI world that governments, municipalities will have to face moving forward? Oh, well, <laughs> all of this is is all of this essentially is unprecedented, right? You know, when we started, when OpenAI launched ChatGPT, um, there was one, two, possibly three large language models. They were the first to launch. There's over, and they're not even the largest. That That's not even the largest one. And, and uh, But there are over, at last count, 54 large language models operating around the world right now. So for different reasons, for different purposes, but, uh, and some of them are dealing with trillions of data points okay um we're not even talking billions anymore and so uh, the 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 rate at which that is happening is uh, that proliferation effect i was telling you before about that, that's one of the largest challenges that we as a society have um and so th that's why governments have to move so quickly to try to keep this is going to be the fastest i think that that global governments will have to react to regulating a certain segment because if they don't right the the recipe we don't get a second chance let's just put it that way right and by the way um it's not that nuclear war the threat of nuclear war isn't a an, a really important thing um it's that we can you know, as humans sort of control whether one or the other pushes a button, right? But if, you know, you have to rely on that that sort of human ethics and morals to, to not push the button, even though you want rattle the saber. Well, when it comes to AI, once that's out of the out of our control, it's smarter than us and it has unlimited resources, okay? If it wants to protect, and by the way, once AI develops its own emotional intelligence and sense of self, that is the trigger point. That's the lightning rod, okay? Because the second that it develops its own emotional intelligence quotient and its sense of self, well, what's the number one thing on its mind right after that second, right? Self-preservation. Okay, so that doesn't necessarily mean, though, that there are going to be massive, you know, that this is where the words Terminator and, you know, Skynet start usually coming up into the conversation, <laughs> right? Uh, in fact, it, it, the issue, though, is it's much more likely that th that's inefficient. That's an inefficient use of resources, okay? It's great for Hollywood, but massive, massive robot manufacturing just to eliminate humans, not likely. What's much more likely is a very you know unique bio um virus that we a novel biohazard virus that we just won't see coming because all the atoms that we make up it will want for its use and yes you are listening to the lighthearted show the political <laughs> trenches local government at work yes um, Walter, I want to thank you so much for taking time and sitting down with us. Really? For our listeners and to our viewers, the link to Walter's social media pages and website are in the show notes. So if you want to learn more, reach out to him or even find out where he's going to be speaking next, head over to his website. I'm assuming it's all there. I did a deep dive when, where, where I found a little bit more about him. So head over there and check it out. But Walter, thank you so much for talking us through and now giving me nightmares about the unprecedented challenges that governments face in 2024. Thank you so much. I'm only the messenger. <laughs> <laughs> Thanks, Walter. One, one of them. But thank you so much, Chris. And uh, Ian, I really appreciated the opportunity to speak with you and your audience. And I hope that, uh, you know, it, it's not uh, necessarily all doom and gloom, but it is. it should be taken seriously. 
Thanks. So our full interview with Walter will be airing next Wednesday. We'll be right back after a quick brief message. Ian, you nice. is for unprecedented challenges. And after that interview, we have some unprecedented challenges off the bat. Uh, it was great to chat with Walter and the stories that we talked about today were such a great way to start 2024, yeah. Yeah. weren't they? It was. I, it, it, we, we laughed a bit at the end of it all. I think it was probably nervous laughter more than anything else and going down rabbit holes and peeling onions and all those other metaphors as well. But whether we like it or not, this is something that our listeners and everybody else is going to have to face in coming years for sure. So forewarned, I guess, in some ways is forearmed and it's not all bad either. That's true. Um, so for everyone, oh, this will be we'll be off uh, next week. We will have our full interview with Walter, as we just said. And then a week later, we'll be back with V is for volunteerism. So you won't want to miss that because we'll be talking about how the volunteer world has changed over the last few years. So stay tuned for that. Ian, it's always a pleasure to sit down with you and talk to you about the political trenches and, of course, local government at work. Always a pleasure, except this time. But thanks, Chris. Thank you.